Hello and welcome to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I am your host, Raya Salter. I'm an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I'm also the principal attorney of Imagine Power, LLC. So today, we're going to take a look at important energy and utility news from Hawaii, around the country, and the world, as reported in the last week. So first, let's take a look at some recent developments in clean energy and clean energy policy in the islands. The biggest story out today, I think you're going to hear that from many sources, and I hope you pay attention to many different points of view. The Hawaii Public Utility Commission has approved utility plans that include massive rate increases for Hawaii rate pay payers. In an incredibly important development, the PUC has given the initial green light to the HECO Company's PSIP, or Power Supply Improvement Plan, which include massive rate hikes for Hawaii rate pay payers. Le uh, we've got a graphic that uh, we can show here that um, will illustrate what, what this means for ratepayers. So here you go. Now, I, I try and stay away from uh, too much in the way of, um, you know, nuts and bolts sort of geek out graphics like this, but this I really think we need to take a look at. So what you got is projections out on two different time frames, and what we're looking at for um, the 2026 time frame 44, more than 44% rate increase for HECO, that means Oahu, 42% rate increase for HELCO, that means the Big Island, and 23% rate increase for MECO, that means Maui. So as you look at that graphic, what you've got is upward trends. So let's go ahead and um, talk a little bit about that. So given the substantial, and we can move away from the graphic, thank you so much. So Given the substantial increase in rates forecasted in the report, the Commission um, is concerned, um, and they did make a statement in their ruling. So this is what was said by the Commission. The Commission is concerned that the companies have not fully considered the affordability of their plans. The companies have provided only limited responses to the Commission's instruction to analyze customer and implementation risks. The companies do not appear to have evaluated the capital investments, financial commitments, and the resulting increasing rates in the context of affordability to customers and the risk of stra stranded assets. So I'm going to pause here and talk a little bit about what the, the Commission's concerns mean. And, and to be totally honest with you, I don't see the justification for an approval of a plan given that grave level of concern. So what the Commission is talking about is that we've got a massive grid improvement plan and there doesn't seem to be, have been enough thought in terms of what is it going to mean to implement this? What is success and failure going to mean? What are the opportunity costs involved in this plan? What does it mean for the residential ratepayers who pay the highest electricity costs in the entire country? What does it mean for stranded assets? And let's talk a little bit about stranded assets. Writ large, stranded assets are one of the, I think, the more controversial issues that happen any time you get a grid transformation scheme, when you look at it historically, and I think it's important to look at it historically. So traditionally, a, um, a utility makes investments in big capital expenses. This is the traditional utility business model big billion dollar nuclear plants. We're going to talk a little later about how South Korea is abandoning some nuclear uh, ideas for future nuclear plants. Billions of dollars for nuclear plants. Billions of dollars for large power plants. And then they get to recoup that investment from who? The ratepayers, customers, you and I. This means you've got long-term investments that last over our lifetimes, sometimes our children's lifetimes that we can, that are in the ground that we continue to pay for. So that's, that is what is at stake from even just the initial push for electricity infrastructure and why it's so important that we switch to clean and renewable energy. So it is important that we do that. What does it mean to have stranded assets? Well, it, in most jurisdictions, I think actually in every jurisdiction that has an investor-owned utility, there's, there are a network of agreements and laws that have been um, in place since utilities were given monopoly franchises. One of them is sort of a loose deal that universal service, folks are going to get service in exchange for exclusivity in that market. 
So as we have walked forward with various utility reforms and business model reforms that in attempt to incorporate market liberalization into the grid, which is the concept that you can derive competition from the regulated markets, uh, you can derive efficiencies by inserting competitive forces into the regulated markets. Um, at times, and, and in other jurisdiction, jurisdictions, this has required that um, utilities divest of certain assets. So utility is entitled, per the law in most jurisdictions where there's an investor-owned utility, to recoup those big investments that they make. So what happens if the plan is for them to turn directions, for them to turn the boat and do something different? Do you think that we get the money back? Who, who pays for what that big investment that is no longer going to be utilized at that scale that we first thought? We paid for it the first time. Guess who pays for it the second time? Yes, for the most part, it is again the rate payer. So again, historically, in other jurisdictions where utilities were told to divest um, of major assets, that meant big changes in their investment plans, and that meant very, very large billion dollar payments to utilities um, beca because of that opportunity cost or that stranded asset. Um, it, so much so that I think in many cases it was considered uh, windfall payments. Um, this happened a lot in the 70s and 80s, and um, it, it, quite often it was considered windfall payments and it has been very controversial. So I think I think it's tremendously interesting and also very, very troubling that we are entering this stage in Hawaii of major infrastructure modernization, a major revamping of the, the rules of engagement that will clearly benefit, uh, clearly at this point anyway, benefit the utility at the expense of a major rate hike for rate payers without having thought consciously about affordability, about risk, about opportunity cost, about cost to society and cost to ratepayers, about the cost to the most vulnerable ratepayers in the entire country, the very poor ratepayers here who suffer more than any other ratepayers in the country. What will a 44% increase in utility bills mean to a fixed income, um, low in fixed income, low income resident, say, on Oahu? That this has not been considered holistically, yet this plan has been green-lighted, is it's really astounding. Because what we really should be looking at is, what are the full costs of this transformation? What are the risks? What are the opportunity costs? Who will shoulder those risks? Who will get the benefits in a conscious way? Um, and this is something that I think has been done frankly better in some other jurisdictions. Now, uh, I have practiced in New York has the New York plan, I think, been completely holistic in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, what stranded assets look like, who will pay for what? No, I won't say that it has, but has it been clear on what it's trying to do in terms of, look, our goal is to build this platform that can include more distributed generation, one, two. Our goal is to split this market up between the utility and the private players, and here are the rules of engagement. So this is how this large pie is going to be split between the private sector and the public sector and the investor-owned utilities. And yes, plans for increased community engagement and environmental justice. Has New York gone as far as they should? No. Has New York gone as far as California, where they have a major cap-and-trade program, the proceeds of which and many times go towards community and environmental justice concerns? No. But has there been a discussion? Has there been a portioning of the market? Is there an understanding amongst the community of, of, of regulators and others of what's going on? Yes. Does more need to be done? Yes. A t undertaking, I think what I'm trying to say is that undertaking this kind of cost is the equivalent of entering into a major grid modernization um, scheme or plan in Hawaii, and that it would be done as an afterthought or as a concern with a lack of planning, that this wouldn't be in the forefront of the conversation, I think, is a concern. Now, I do want to say that I think HECO has, in many, in many cases, done a fantastic job of managing the highest uh, uh, solar PV penetration level 
you know, in the entire country. You know, we know that HECO is, is dealing with, with grid modernization. How can it move on to this next, um, this next level of grid modernization for Hawaii? So I, and, and I understand that the Commission has also really had to grapple with a lot of issues with limit, at times with limited resources. Um, so I, I don't want to be um, overly critical. I want anything I have to say to be in the light of helpfulness. And I think what I think what would would be best if, if we can really talk about this massive, massive investment. It doesn't look like a massive investment right now, but when you add up the numbers of what 44% rate increase means, when you add up the numbers of what stranded assets could mean, we're talking about a major restructuring effort in Hawaii without, I think, intention enough intention and a conversation about what is the intention for um, this grid modernization or restructuring plan in Hawaii um, is extremely important. So I, gosh, there's so much to say, um, but I'll, I'll go on a little bit and talk about one of the key reasons what this plan is, is willing to do. And I remember when I came here in 2014 to speak at uh, the Maui Energy Conference, I came because New York was looking to, pr to, to build, the specific plan was, we're going to build a platform. We're going to build a platform that will allow um, more, the integration of more renewable energy and distributed generation. And at the time, we knew that Hawaii was working and grappling with some grid modernization efforts at the time, I don't think that it looked like the plan was similar. It didn't look like we were looking to do a platform here. But the truth is, is that, is that we were. <laughs> so what does this grid modernization plan do? What is all of this money um, in this market major market restructuring that is really happening kind of under the radar? What does it mean? Well, the HECO grid plan could enable as much as three times more rooftop solar in Hawaii. Overall, the new plan will shift the bulk of funding from physical infrastructure-based wire solutions to grid modernization solutions, which really what we're talking about is smart grid, with HECO planning to spend only $49 million on wire solutions through 2023. So the utility states the initial focus of the plan is to mitigate existing service quality issues that are arising so as to continue to enable ongoing customer adoption of solar and batteries. HECO also seeks to create a platform whereby distributed energy resources, a broad category that includes not only solar and batteries, but demand response and other technologies, can help to meet the state's 2045 renewable goal. This will require a deployment of technology both on the customer and utility side of the meter. Unlike earlier plans, which called for wide split, widespread deployment of smart meters, in order to save costs, HECO is now calling for such meters to be deployed surgically, which will include customers with rooftop solar on circuits that HECO considers saturated, and those that are uh, nearing such levels. This deployment will include related software to help customers make better decisions about usage. So, like I said, it seemed a couple of years ago that we weren't talking about a platform. Now that's exactly what we're talking about. So, we're going to move to a break. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the big HECO plan and other things happening in Hawaii and around the country. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Hello and welcome back to Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. I'm your host, Raya Salter. So you just heard me sort of say a whole lot of things about the greenlit HECO power supply improvement plan, and I just, I just have to say a few more things. 
we're looking at plans for massive, massive rate hikes for, um, for at least for Maui, the Big Island, and um, Oahu. And we're talking about folks who are already paying the highest rates of energy in the country. And some may say, hey, but you know, overall, folks don't pay as much necessarily. Well, you know what? I don't think you get credit um, because you don't have a heating season. <laughs> I don't think you get credit for certain things. Yes, folks aren't needing to spend a lot of money on heating their homes, but that, I think, is a context that should be removed from the discussion. Um, energy costs are too high in Hawaii, and there are a lot of concerns, and the commission shares them, about what this power supply improvement plan will mean. So I said a lot of things, but I also want to say, again, hopeful, very positive, I think the most important, really the most important thing to say is that, okay, Hawaii is on the path towards grid modernization. That is going to happen. The company has a plan. Does this mean that the company has been told that it is okay for them to start spending money left and right on the specific plan? Actually, no. You know, often that's not how these regulatory things work. I think, and it's the same thing that happened in New York, the rubber will hit the road in the rate cases for, the, um, for each utility in succession as they come about. Uh, that's where the rubber really hits the road in terms of the specific proposals are made and what is able to be spent. I will talk a little bit about what I think, you know, I talked about this, this what really is a, a major restructuring and market restructuring plan that is happening under the radar with this PSIP. And really what we're talking about, if they're going to build this platform, and we also talked about it's going to really enable for increased amount of solar and other um, distributed energy resources, yes, that's good. That's the point. I've talked many times that, that you know, the state cannot afford for ratepayers to do all of the spending, that we need to have private industry and the innovation that comes alongside it playing in the game. So we want this to be good for, for the clean energy industry and the distributed energy resources industry. We want to find and capture efficiencies and innovation, and we want the utility to be able to continue to be you know, a big employer in the state, um, an innovator, and a just you know, a positive force in the community as we move to get off of um, oil and increase our energy security. But we cannot do it it cannot be at any cost. It can be not be at any cost in terms of affordability. Uh, and what does it mean for us to be paying into the system at such a large, uh, such a large percentage? What does it mean for us to be paying into the system? And what do we get in return? So, what are the community level opportunities for this platform? How will residents and other folks who are looking to um, uh, survive and thrive in Hawaii, as we all know, is really, really, really hard. What will the opportunities, what will the business opportunities be? What will the economic opportunities be? How will, um, how will various different um, populations, be it um, racial or ethnic or whatever part of the island that you live on, um, how will people be able to participate? How will they have a voice? How will it be fair? How will folks be able to economically participate in this green energy economy besides only the green energy companies? And what will be the environmental and land use, uh, and environmental justice and land use justice um, and climate justice implications of this, of these distributed energy resources? So what do I mean by that? Is it okay for um, for certain folks to use their people to go out and build these distributed energy resources throughout communities, what are those resources going to look like here? I think we've all, um, on all of our hikes in Oahu, and we love hiking and we love getting up in those mountains, I know we do, but what are we doing for most of the time? We're hiking up to some busted piece of infrastructure. We're going up to uh, something that the military has left. We're going up to <laughs> stand next to some cell phone tower or some old piece of energy infrastructure. Nobody knows really what it's doing. And I'm sure there are a lot of beautiful reasons, and we love our infrastructure. However, what are these assets going to look like? Who's going to have to look at them? Can they be designed so that they are not eyesores? Can we see, as these poles and, and wires are abandoned that we talked about, can we see them going away? Imagine the roads and the vistas in Hawaii without big, ugly poles and wires. Thank goodness we don't have um, lots of advertisements. 
imagine if, 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 if distributed energy allows for that to recede. This, this infrastructure m takes steps back. Where infrastructure is causing potentially a health problem or a visual problem, can that be solved? You know, can we, can we actually improve the quality of people's lives and, 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 and increase participation in the energy system? Um, and, and also the biggest question, I think, where are these assets going to go in terms of land use? They're gonna, there's not a lot of land. Where will the solar farms go? Where will the biomass go? Where will um, biofuel be planted, if anywhere at all? This is going to mean there'll be winners and losers. Do you want to be the person who lives next to a, 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 you know, a plant, a biomass facility? Do you want to be the person who lives next to that big solar farm and that land has been used in that way when what you really wanted to see was um, just a clean, you know, a clean view of the ocean? And what does this happen and to whom? What parts of the island will be, will be given favor? Will it be low-income folks or will it be high-income folks? Guess what, guys? Not trying to make any villains, but traditionally, <laughs> when it comes to NIMBY, not in my neighborhood, it tends to be low-income folks who end up with the fuzzy end of the lollipop. Now, why do I go on and on and on about this? Because this is exactly the work that I engaged in in New York. We worked with social justice, um, poverty groups, racial justice groups, and we just wanted to enter the conversation. How can this benefit everybody? Um, and I think what we drummed up was a commitment within the reforming the energy vision process um, to environmental justice protections. Now, what they'll actually mean going forward, will that actually be you know, substantive in terms of rules? I'm gonna say yes, because I know that the advocates back home are working hard at it. <laughs> um, but that this stuff is absent here, um, I think is a problem. And I look forward to talking to folks about what this is going to mean. Um, what this is going to mean. Is it going to be um, Hawaii and Hawaii's uh, culture and Hawaii's progressiveness? Is it going to be a meaningful transition that is just and fair to everyone that makes Hawaii cleaner? and more beautiful and more affordable as um, and all the islands of Hawaii as, as a model for the world? Or are we going to have um, an unaffordable transition that is going to saddle our young people with extremely high, um, high debts for the rest of their productive lives? Big questions. Moving right along. Denver-based renewable energy company Syntec Bioenergy has opened its first office in Hawaii. The sales and field service office which is located in Honolulu, will support local installation of Syntex Bioenergy's technology for delivering clean energy through advanced thermal conversion of biomass and other waste materials, the company said in a statement. Now, this office will be headed by Dr. Chris Guai, who has over 15 years of experience working in the renewable energy industry. So we're talking about a Punahou boy, local boy, who says energy security is a big issue in Hawaii. Syntex biomass energy systems will contribute to the growth of local renewable energy resources in achieving the state's goal of 100% clean energy by 2045. Syntex biomass systems are powered by a variety of biomass and waste materials, including wood chips, nut shells, and fruit pits. The systems are housed in standard ISO shipping containers, making them easy to transport and install. The biomax units are scalable from 165 kilowatt up to 1 megawatt. So the company is currently planning to install, install additional units in California, Texas, and Japan. There are currently no specific plans for a biomax system in Hawaii. So why did I really want to talk about this? One, I think it's cool that we've got this, um, what looks like, what's a cool energy firm that realizes that you know, this particular type of technology, biomass, can be really valuable for islands. So where do they decide to come? Boom, here, right at the crossroads between here and Asia. They're going to use a local fellow, hopefully generate some jobs and some money for folks here um, to uh, sell some systems um, back on the mainland and also, um, also in Japan. So I think that is super cool. Uh, another reason why I wanted to talk about it, just as I said, Fruit pits, nutshells, it's all well and good. I'm not speaking to this technology, but the consequences of these technologies, even clean energy technologies, um, are very significant. Um, and as somebody who has been to um, some biomass facilities, it's 
isn't something that you want to smell. You don't want to be next to. And I think we've all experienced driving past um, some either uh, wastewater treatment plant facilities, biomass facilities. So there really are consequences um, to, to these distributed energy resources. And you know what? I think I'm going to take a pledge. I'm going to stop talking about Hawaii's 100% renewable energy goal. Um, I have been an advocate for RPS and aggressive RPS, and I've celebrated this goal over the past two years with everybody else, and I continue to believe in RPS. But this, I think, has turned into a rallying cry for 100% renewable energy <laughs> without thoughts, enough thoughts about affordability, about sustainability, about resilience. It cannot be 100% renewable energy for 100% renewable energy's sake. As much as we need to have energy independence here, there are a lot of other conversations that need to happen in that context because as uh, the Commission is also concerned about, what are the risks in implementation, both in terms of money, both in terms of the environment? What happens to these distributed assets? Who's going to be watching the companies that are going to be playing on this? What are they going to install? Um, who's going to fix it? Will folks invest in things that just become more of this infrastructure that we hike to and sort of try and overlook as we, as we both mostly bask in the beauty of the ocean and the clouds? Will quality of life become worse when it comes to energy here in terms of better? And when you think about higher energy rates, um, there's a real trade-off there. Uh, the last thing I was going to talk about that I'll just touch on for a minute is that at the Verge conference, there was a lot of discussion about um, the culture of Hawaii um, and how much that culture lends itself towards um, clean energy. And so I think we really need to think, is that lip service? Are we going to have folks come and um, you know, say a few words and we're all going to give a blessing about clean energy and yet it's off to the races without looking at the moral and um, justice implications of what's going on? I think that's a problem. And I think that we really need to work on these things that are happening under the radar, which, of course, is what Think Tech is all about. <laughs> Some things happen under the radar here in Hawaii, and Think Tech will take you there. So I had a lot to say. I hope it was informative in some way. <laughs> this is Raya Salter signing off for Power Up Hawaii. Aloha, everyone.